This is further proof that long live the sponge, Michelle. <laughs> Follow your oddities and fly your freak frag. <laughs> I would like to say that if you can't love yourself, how in the hell are you going to look over there? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Shea Coulee, and I didn't come to slay. I came to win! <laughs> Our last four reigning queens are all black queens, which has been a really amazing thing to see. Oh. E- <laughs> Evie, <what's- laughs> you were having a feeling the moment there. How does it make you feel to know you're part of this kind of legacy, this moment of four in a row? Um, it It's kind of a trip because uh, like long before I got on Drag Race, I was a fan of the show. I watched it and the one personal critique I always had was I always just felt like specifically in the way that black queens were received by the fan base like we were never given the same opportunities to shine our careers didn't take off afterwards in the same ways and so it it was at first mind-blowing for me to be a part of this legacy and now it's less shocking and more just it it feels really good to know that people in general are, are more willing to like step back and like check their biases and be like, I like this queen, but uh, what are the reasons why I like her? What are the reasons I'm not following these girls? And I think the more we have these conversations, like the better the, better the future of Drag Race is gonna be because clearly black excellence exists. And I think it's about time that we we been given the props for all the work we put in. I think that the RuPaul's Drag Race in itself, the franchise has always celebrated queens of color. Um, But I I think the piece of the puzzle that people miss is quite often the fans pick the winner. When the competition wraps, opportunities and, and work and jobs come almost solely from what is your social media following. And the fans do decide that, and the fans make it clear um, at the end of each season who is their winner and who is not. Um, um, and quite often, you will have someone that was a winner or in the top three of their season sitting at home while someone that maybe went home fourth or fifth is touring around the world. And it's because um, um, at the end of the day, the true outcome of RuPaul's Drag Race is a popularity contest. Well, and it. It does feel that sometimes the black queens almost have to defend their art more than some of the white queens. And Evie, you kind of just had a moment with Katya having to do this because there's a a snarky line in her and Trixie's book about what you wore to drag con. Yeah. (laughs) Have you been able to talk things out with Katya since? I feel like it opened a dialogue, at least with the fandom. I'm glad it opened a dialogue with the fandom, which is the reason that I even responded to that, that like, cause uh, I think the fans deserve it more than Katya deserves it. And I I think if Katya like wanted to like have a chat about how and why it's messed up that she decided to publish a book and include a whole non sequitur passage on why this one specific queen of color is garbage and why she doesn't look good and why her drag is bad. I would love to have that conversation with her, but she's still operating from her place of privilege where she, if you look at, just like, like Asia was saying, if you look at our follower counts, like she is doing way better than me. She's staying way more booked. She's being way busier. And I honestly just don't think she's at a place right now where she knows how to check her privilege. Okay, and probably a conversation to have before you put it in print than one Yeah, after. That's, that's what I would have done, but that's why I wanted to respond to it, because I think the fans deserve to know my perspective. I stayed silent for the better part of a year while I received, like, death threats, like, racist hate mail, people on the regular calling me, like, garbage or saying that my smelly ass deserved to die and all of this. And I, I just took it because I know that as a representative, for the show, I had to be strong and I had to be forward. But there's also gotta be a certain point where you're like, okay, okay, I understand nobody wants to hear the flaws called out, but the way you perceive black queens, the way you perceive what I'm capable of doing is is already in an unfair system. I think that yes and no, because there are like, Katya is coming from a place also, when you think of drag, you have to kind of like hit a lot of bullet points when you're doing drag. 
traditional drag and kind of when you go on drag race you kind of like sign up for those bullet points too so i think that katya coming from a place and saying that evie wearing like smudged eyeliner and a t-shirt dress and like making a joke about a hundred thousand dollars i don't necessarily see a huge privilege or huge racism like point behind that and i hope that that's like kind of something that we don't get too focused on because we are so i mean we're judgy facts you know so <laughs> we're always gonna have something to say and I, i do agree that maybe in a published book was not the setting to voice those things <laughs> that's more of a tweet or maybe just a text or an instagram comment i had this conversation with evie and i think it was that she just felt like um some people can you know they'll uh, they'll kind of jump on somebody and but they'll like excuse others but yeah um i definitely think a lot of the queens of color are not as appreciated or like asia is one of my favorite um points she was really popular before drag race um in the pageant industry or you know circuit and i just feel like sometimes they're not as appreciated as you know other i i will say that asia's point in that work the world docu series where she said like she doesn't necessarily think the fan base is racist but the fact that they're like the fan base they can connect to a, a white blonde girl more so because there's just more that make up the fan base. That was a very good point. You uh, look out in the audience and you don't see anybody that looks like you. You shouldn't be surprised when they come to the meet and greet and don't want to take a picture with you. So how is Vegas Review different from what we've seen on Work the World? I mean, Work the World itself is just a, a different experience because you go to sleep on a bus and you wake up every day in a different city. So you're you're kind of getting a peek behind the curtain at our lives and what it's what it's like to be a drag queen. But with the Vegas Review, like you get to see us live a full life instead of being like, where am I? What city is this? What coffee am I drinking? Oh, <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I also think, you know, one thing with Work the World, we're normally in front of diehard Drag Race fans. And the Vegas show is somewhat different because about 80% of the audience each night are people that are, you know, in Vegas to have a good time. They see our show and it's like, oh, I want to go watch this. And they may not be as familiar with the television show as other people. So it's um, a little bit more of, of, of a task to get them um, to understand who we are and what we do. Um, and also I think, or, or at least for me, you know, with Work the World, we have a lot more creative control over our portions of the show and what we present in the show. Um, and the Vegas show, you know, we're coming into something that has already been created um, with us in mind, but already been created. So it's a completely different, as an artist, it's a completely different um, vibe. So like in Work the World, um, we get you get a little bit of our personal life, but I really think this docu-series showcases what is happening in our personal life just as much as what you're seeing on stage. So I think it's really cool to see that part. I, I, I don't think we've seen it. Even the work of the world, I don't think it's been this close to home for us.